Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. In the next uh, hour, I will try to I will try to share with you uh, my experience with the use uh, of uh, external fixation for pelvic fractures. Um, so uh, please be aware that we are organizing this kind of webinars every Wednesday till December 16. So it's a long way to, to run, uh, but uh, I think that I hope that we can provide some useful piece of information. Um, I won't be the only uh, speaker for all the seminars. Next week, the speaker will be Dr. Jan Nisdo from Prague, talking about uh, this uh, radius and ulna factors in toy breeds. You can check and uh, for, for the program, for the title of the event and for the speaker, uh, on our website, so you can check it. Of course, not all the weeks the, the lecture will be given in the same language. We will have uh, webinars in uh, English as today, in Spanish and in Italian. So, of course, it will depend on uh, the week uh, in order for the attendees to be able to attend or not following following the lecture, okay? So, um, we will have at the end of the webinar the option to uh, ask questions. Uh, so, uh, the question should be uh, placed in uh, um, by chat, the chat that you can find uh, at the right edge of your screen, and I will try to answer to any question should arise. Okay, so we can just start with the with the lecturing, and uh, what is the rationality for applying external fixation. We should be aware, and I think that everybody more or less is, that uh, uh, external fixation is not the standard technique that uh, has been proposed and uh, used for fracture and uh, the, for, for pelvic fractures. Okay, so what what is the rationality for it? using it. Uh, Non-reconstructible fractures. So when I don't want to make an approach, a surgical approach to the patient, already with the feeling that I won't be able to stabilize enough, to reduce enough the fracture. Uh, why? Because it can be that we can consider a different approach to stabilize the fracture, to realign the pelvic fragments, the pelvic fragments of the bone, but not to perform a procedure, uh, for example, uh, scheduling and plating, and I will, I'm checking to the fracture features and I realize that I won't be able to put all the pieces together, okay? This is the kind of feeling. Ideally, of course, without hip involvement. This, of course, it's ideal simply because the stabilization of articular joint fracture is much more demanding that stabilization of extra articular bone segments. But we will see that uh, both cases can be present, of course. The most important conceptual point in my experience 
is when I need a greater leverage than just uh, what I can achieve with just internal fixation. What I mean? The fact that when I have complex characters, I can either perform a very aggressive surgical approach in uh, try stabilizing many different fractures or just to uh, stabilize the most important part of the fracture. But in most cases, in that case, I will just have a short lever arm. And this is very important because, as you know, we don't have to be just with the surgical part of the management of the patient, but also with the postoperative part of the management. And if the stabilization is not strong enough, we will experience complications. And in most cases, that kind of complication, breakage of the implant or refractor or mobilization of the implant are even worse than the original factor. What I'm expecting from the use of external fixation. In most cases, as you will see in a minute, I like to have an internal fixation, but it's just a small one, just dedicated to the most important part of the fracture that I'm willing to stabilize. And then I will take advantage of a greater level R of the external fixation of the external fixator that can be as long as the pelvis itself, so it won't be greater than the plate, as usually happens if I just put a short plate, uh, so that I can take advantage to help the plate in stabilize the fracture, and after some weeks, three, four weeks, I can remove the fixator because the uh, uh, early callus, early callus will be already formed, and this will help a lot in sharing the load with the internal implants. To treat fractures in areas where the internal fixation is unsafe or ineffective, and we can see the most classical example of this when we have to deal with uh, uh, fractures of the uh, particular process of the sacrum that should not be mixed up with the fracture luxation, fracture, fracture dislocation of the sacrum joint. What do I mean? This kind of situation, as you can see here, this is not just, just a fracture luxation of the sacroiliac joint, but it's a true fracture here, this piece of bone here, means that we have a fracture, real fracture of the particular process of the sacrum. In this kind of situation, in most cases, just the thing to insert a screw, for, for example, a a compression screw can be very dangerous in this area. Also because if you don't have the option of performing a CT scan in this patient, in most cases, we don't have a precise clue about the fracture that we may have at the sacrum level. So in certain screws in the sacrum, we are uncertain if we have more fracture lines here can be unsafe, okay? Other situation can be complex fractures like this. We may have a look to this kind of patient fracture here of the sac particular process uh, uh, of the sacrum, uh, a fracture of the acetabulum, with medialization of this area, but most importantly, if we look to uh, what we can, of course, much better evaluate 
with a, a CT scan. You can see here in this area that we have the kind of fragmentation that will make, in my hands at least, uh, this kind of approach not just unsafe, let's say, but also in most cases ineffective. Why? Because even though I can use a strong plate, uh, the plate will need a hard bone in order to be effective in stabilizing this kind of fracture. So the risk that I see in that kind of patient is to perform a very aggressive approach, not being able to reduce the fracture because in most cases the fragments are on the inner part in the pelvic canal directed in the in the direction of the pelvic canal so very difficult to reach and very difficult to reduce so in that case my thought is this dog can be a candidate for a next uh, hyperstasis for example yes it can be the the uh, degenerative process of this hip will be so severe that pain will be a major issue. So I don't want to perform a useless attempt to reduce fracture that I already have the feeling I won't be able to reduce and I will leave this option for the next decision. Okay, this is more or less rationality that I want to use. So, uh, if we decide to use the external fixation, we need the landmarks that we should use in order to put our fixator. And they are quite simple because on the uh, iliac part of the pelvis, we have the uh, crest of the ilial wing, the dorsal crest, that is a very easy and straightforward and marks to palpate and to identify so no problems at all in identifying this landmark uh, the caudal landmark that is the ischial tuberosity is a little bit more tricky simply because i want to get the tuberosity not the flat surface of the ischial and this is because even the big dog, this flat part of the issue is a few millimeter, three, four, five millimeter thick, and this can be an issue for an external fixator. Tibia tuberosity is much thicker, even not that thick, of course, but much thicker. So I will try to take advantage of this kind of and then, of course, this we will see in the next cases, we are already here in this area at both sides of the, uh, of the tail root. So we don't have at that many room to get more medially, okay? So for these two reasons. At the end of the insertion, we will get this kind of stabilization. Since the direction of insertion of the cranial threaded pin, I won't consider, I won't consider any smooth pin, okay? So to me, it doesn't make any sense to use smooth pins for this kind of fixation as any other kind of external fixation. So when I'm dealing with external fixation, I always, always refer to threaded pin and specific threaded pins, pins that are not trocker tip. The, the, the tip is not trocker. Why? Because trocker tip is not suited to cut bone 
so the quality of the thread will be very poor. I want to insert uh, threaded pins that I will insert exactly as an uh, orthopedic screw. So pre-drilling, and then I will thread the, the pin in, in a way that I will get the best possible thread quality. This is quite normal due to the uh, conformation, anatomical conformation of the iliac wing. It is completely possible that we will start inserting the uh, pin from the proximal medial side to the distal lateral and it's completely it happens very quite often that we will get out from the lateral part of the wing and then get in again because of the conformation so this is quite normal and at the end we will have this kind of uh, distribution of for the a pelvis for the hemi pelvis it can be the same on the opposite side and we will see in a while to in order to have good purchase of the thread pin in the hemi pelvis so technique uh, we need a good positioning of the patient uh, and the positioning is due to the fact the need for this positioning that is sternal recumbency with a soft padded uh, 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 cushion in between uh, hind limbs and this is because I want to be able to palpate the landmarks and I want to be able to uh, put the frame bilaterally without any interference and I want to be able to do that if the patient will be on lateral recumbency okay so this is the positioning that I want to for this uh, kind of uh, of procedure and of course if I can use fluoroscopy intraoperatively it will help a lot in the finding the correct positioning but i would say not mandatory meaning that of course if you have fluoroscopy you can have a good help in the find the uh, positioning but with the uh, a good training on the cadaver for example you can reach a good feeling about where to position the pins without fluoroscopy because the landmarks are easily easily accessible okay easily accessible so <clears throat> first landmark as we mentioned illegal ring uh, using fluoroscopy i can check the direction with a sleeve because i can see the all the central or of the sleeve and based on the shape of this part that is the central or of the sleeve uh, I can realize I can understand the inclination where I, I'm putting the pin through and this is very useful of course also the uh, observation of the direction of the threaded pin will help a lot and this is the insertion and stabilization on of the pin on the illal wing and then i this is a scalpel blade so small stab incision stab incision and then i will prepare this area exactly as for any other external fixation meaning with a mosquito i'm opening this area uh, through soft tissues and I will prepare this area of the ischial tuberosity to insert the threaded pin through it okay what happens if I need to perform a reduction of 
and acetabular fracture, for example, I don't want to get into this area because I don't think I will be able to get good reduction, but I want to realign, okay? If the dog is a very small one, we can use also rectal palpation and pushing through the rectum. This is usually not possible with bigger dogs because we don't have a 20 centimeter finger long, 20 centimeter long fingers. So my technique, preferred technique, in order to be able to realign the, the fracture, not to touch the fracture, not to anatomically reduce the fracture, but to realign it, is this joystick technique. I inserting a threaded pin into the femur in the trochanteric area, like this, okay? This threaded pin, like this. So I will insert this threaded pin through the trochanteric area. This is the reason why I need an extended surgical area that is, has been scrapped, okay? And once I have this threaded pin inserted in the thread in the trochanteric area of the femur, I will put a Jacob chuck on the threaded pin and I will progressively pull. Don't think to pull uh, in a, in a uh, very aggressive way. In most cases, it's just enough to lay on the Jacob chuck, meaning that someone will stay there. It's a good time for jokes to spend some time while we are waiting for the progressive reduction due to the traction that we are exerting. This is the principle of muscle, muscle, muscle ligamentotaxis. What does it mean? That taken advantage from the fact that the bone fragments are not detached from the muscles, I will be able performing this traction on the uh, femur to uh, pull on all the area and I will be able to realign the axis of the hemipelvis without opening. This is the interesting part of the story, okay? Okay, just the first example of a case a small dog hit by car as you see and as i think it's a common experience most of the dogs <coughs> or cats have high energy traumas because in order to fracture the pelvis the uh, we uh, it's a, a high level energy is required so we have this kind of uh, situation. You can see that there is a fracture here on the right hemipelvis, but we have also a true luxation of the sacroiliac joint. This is not fracture, but you can see here this line on the uh, 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 joint to the joint process of the sacrum, articular process of the sacrum. So careful in this case, because here we have a fracture of the sacrus, okay? This is the other projection, lateral projection, as you can see, is a long oblique fracture, difficult one, even with plates. Why? Because with plates here, it's uh, uh, in most cases difficult, the plate uh, axis will follow the axis of the fracture. So it's not always easy with straight place, plates to have the correct angle that is capable to effectively stabilize this kind of fracture. If I want to understand more properly the hemipelvis shape of the fracture, 
I can usually this kind of projection that are oblique projection on the axis on the hemi pelvis, okay? In order to better understand exactly where are the fracture line. And of course, if I want to be as uh, precise and to understand as much as possible, I will go for a CT scan. That is always the best way to understand correctly complex fractures of the pelvis. Okay, this is an old case, but I still think that it, it has some uh, interesting point. So we perform this uh, uh, osteosynthesis of the right uh, uh, um, um, uh, ileal wing, okay? Here, we perform stabilization of the luxation of the left uh, sacroiliac joint. And here, as you can see, we put an external fixator, but instead of putting on the previous landmarks that I commented on, since here we have the problem of the fracture area, and here we have the problem of this line, of fracture line on the uh, sacral process, joint process, we decided to put this uh, threaded pin on the uh, process of the sacrum, okay? So this is the sagittal projection and this is the lateral projection, so you can better realize the distribution. It was just a, a pro cranial, cranial fixator. I thought that we didn't need to further stabilize here. Perhaps we may have put this uh, on the another threaded pin on the right issue as well. Okay, this was our de decision at that time. This is one of the very first cases. As you can see, of course, we suffer from the radiographic interference from the fixator. And this is due to the fact that we use standard Maynard clamps. And uh, so with metallic frames, of course, we have this kind of interference that we don't have on the lateral projection. <clears throat> Following the follow-up, uh, we have this uh, uh, option to check. And here you can see that we have some callus form. So we can decide to check if we can remove the fixator before removing these two threaded pins, we check again, why? Simply because if I'm not convinced to remove the fixator, I have the pins in already and I can put the fixator on again while the dog is still under general anesthesia. I'm happy of this so we can remove the old fixator from it. As you can see, not perfect, but we have a good callus and the pelvic canal is open enough not to have any kind of complication related to pelvic stenosis, okay? Today, perhaps I would have put another uh, threaded pin here on the issue in order to hold it more stabilized, okay? But as you know, many things develop and many thoughts will develop with experience. And this is why you are attending the seminar today in the order to acquire some more experience, okay? We have two minutes advertisement. We are on TV, more or less. So we have two minutes advertisement. We will be back in two minutes to, uh, for uh, further cases. In two minutes, be back.
as promised, no more than two minutes. Okay, so we can proceed with uh, the next case. Always uh, a small dog hit by car. Okay, here, <clears throat> uh, sorry, this is the previous one. The, the dog is more or less the same, but the same size, okay? But it's a little bit, a little bit worse. So <clears throat> this kind of fracture, you can realize here that this fracture is uh, uh, a little bit tricky because here we have this long line that means that the ilial wing, the left ilial wing is fractured longitudinally, okay? As always, if I want to better understand how is the fracture, I can perform this uh, oblique views of the pelvis and here you can see how long is the fracture line here. And the displacement, cranial displacement, okay, this is very useful. So we need some strategy in order to stabilize this kind of fracture. Here to stabilize the fracture with place wouldn't be that easy, okay? And the reason is because the plate has not a good purchase on this small fragment, okay? So <clears throat> I decided to put this K wire here. This is a K wire inserted from proximal to distal. Once we had the fracture aligned and the two fragments superimposed, we inserted this K wire in order to stabilize temporarily the fracture. Once the fracture was <coughs> stabilized temporarily, the approach was uh, uh, lateral, dorsolateral to the ilial wing, so quite an easy, straightforward surgical approach. Not too much aggressive, actually, because we are just to elevate the gluteal muscles, medium and deep gluteal muscles, in order to expose the ilial wing. We inserted this threaded pin, two millimeter threaded pin, okay, in the same direction with the same uh, effect of a positioning screw, meaning both the fragments are threaded. So this pin will stabilize the fracture with the same direction that is proximal distal direction of the K wire. And then we will put the other threaded pins that are one on the opposite ideal wing and two on the uh, ischial tuberosities on both sides in order to stabilize the whole shape and axis of the pelvis in this patient, okay? As you can see, they uh, threaded pins that are inserted on the ischial tuberosities are at the level of the tail root. And this means that this can be a potentially contaminated area. So always, always is needed a purse string, purse string suture on the anus on the patient. I actually perform it in every patient, not just for those patients, but in this case it's mandatory a purse string suture on the anus to avoid defecation during the surgery, okay? And once we have those pins put in position like this, we just connect with the polylock fixator that 
is a radiolucent one with the uh, carbon bars and plastic clamps and we will see the difference for the interference for radiographic examination. This is a standard conformation. One important thing, this bar that is uh, used to stabilize the frame in the caudal part should not be too close to the uh, tail root. Why? Because if you put it very close to the tail, the dog won't be able to elevate the tail during defecation, and this will be a problem for him. Okay, so keep a distance at, at least, let's say, a couple of fingers in order to allow the dog to elevate the tail during defecation. And this is the structure uh, from the clinical point of view, as you can see with radiolucent fixators, the our ability to evaluate the uh, overall uh, osteosynthesis is much better. As you can see here, we can see uh, this, uh, the osteosynthesis destabilization on the left uh, ileal wing. This is the K wire that was included into the frame. This is the threaded pin, and those are stabilization pins that will help in maintaining the overall shape and diameter of the pelvic canal. And this is uh, how it looks from the lateral view. Okay, so very simple, very straightforward. The dog was interested to this strange thing, wouldn't you? I think so. This is something, uh, but it, it, she was able to uh, not only uh, work, but also, also to sit and to lie down. So the interference uh, will be minimal. This carbon bar is a bit too long. Of course, we can cut them, but it's much better to select the correct length of the carbon bar because cutting carbon bars, you require, first of all, a burr that is the diamond burr. And second, always, always use a surgical mask because the carbon powder is not good for your health, okay? So this is the positioning <clears throat> and we can uh, check the progression. So and here we add a uh, problem because the dog was painful and the back part, you can see this radiolucent area after about one month, <clears throat> this radiolucent area on the right uh, ischial tuberosity so we decided to remove the posterior part of the fixator. You can see this radiolucent hole compared to the right one that was the stable one, exactly as in external fixation in other segments, but we decided to left this partial fixator in order to stabilize and to leave it for a couple of weeks more in order to have a better healing. And this was at the time of the removal, and this was the final result, and clinically very good result. <clears throat> we can use this in more complex cases. This uh, uh, is a cat that had suffered a multiple pelvic crash fractures because he was crashed from a forklift. He lived in this, uh, <clears throat> in uh, uh, this working environment. They used forklift to move heavy material and the cat was crashed by one of this forklift. So this is a little bit more complex <clears throat> because we have 
a bilateral fracture luxation of the sacroiliac joint and bilateral fracture of the uh, ileal neck. On the right side here, we have a very short fragment and this can be tricky because our capability to stabilize it. Fortunately enough, the caudal part <clears throat> was intact. We evaluated soft tissue as usual. The cat had a severe injury, uh, neurological injury of the left uh, issue, uh, sciatic, sciatic nerve, but this, in my experience, is not uncommon. My suggestion, of course, you have to talk about it with the owners, but my suggestion to the owner is that I would proceed with orthopedic stabilization of the pelvis because we cannot wait one month in order to see how the neurological deficit will progress because otherwise we won't be able to perform the orthopedic procedure. And I think this is my personal convincement and my personal thought that if we stabilize the pelvis, we will reduce the likelihood of having more neurological uh, side effects, more neurological complication, because some Sometimes you realize that is the movement of the pelvic fragments that will damage the uh, the uh, roots of the nerve. Okay, so this is my suggestion to the owner. This <clears throat> is an okay. In this case, of course, we had to perform three positioning during the surgery because we had to perform the first approach on lateral recumbency for left ileal wing stabilization and then on the opposite side for right stabilization and then sternal recumbency for overall stabilization of the pelvis, okay? So this is stabilization of the left ileal wing and we use this kind of, uh, uh, of plate that uh, is uh, and uh, a, a cross plate so that we can the advantage of multiple point where we can insert the screws. <clears throat> and this was the situation after the first stabilization. So we stabilized the uh, sacroiliac joints like this and the fractures with the same plate. The problem here was that we had room enough just to place one screw on uh, the right side, on the acetabular component of a fracture on the right side. And this can be tricky if we don't stabilize the overall pelvic fracture. Why? Because if the dog is weight bearing, he will load this area and with just one screw here, it will perform this kind of torsional instability along this screw. This will be tricky. This will be very likely to promote mobilization of this part, okay? So I prefer to stabilize the overall structure, very simple, very straightforward <clears throat> frame construct. Two two millimeter threaded pins on ileal wings, like this. And two millimeter, two two millimeter threaded pins on ischial tuberosities, like this, okay? So we have the overall frame here. We can see through the fixator. Why? Because it's radiolucent, carbon and plastic. Much easier to understand what we are looking for. <clears throat> and this is the overall structure of the osteosynthesis. Uh, 
please be aware that we shouldn't go too too deep here so please stop with inserting the pins as soon as you realize that you pass through the trans cortex okay don't leave three centimeter useless but uh not good for the patient more a uh, centimeter of uh, threaded pin protruding from from the bone okay this is quite an important detail here in the on the ischial tuberosities three four five millimeter is what we have so don't expect to insert a lot in this case in this area <clears throat> more is not better okay more is not better Okay, this is a few days after the surgery. We had still the uh, sci sciatic uh, neurological deficit and uh, quite a severe lameness, but the dog is uh, wearing the fixator without too many problems. He can do it everything he, he wants and we can examine and follow up what is happening okay so we can follow up to check if it's all stable if the overall structure stay the same if something is moving if we have some progress in bony <clears throat> healing and here you can see that we have some kind of bony colors small very delicate yet but some kind of callus so we can wait a couple of weeks more and then we are removing the external fixator what is the rationale here of course this is not complete is not a complete fracture healing we have still on the right side this kind of situation with just one screw here but this is five six weeks after the osteosynthesis so i'm taking advantage of the fact that the external fixator protected my osteosynthesis during the critical early period of the bone healing now i'm taking advantage of a callus that is not complete, but it's developed enough not to, to, to share the load with the plate, to share the load. So we don't need to completely stabilize with the implant. We can uh, trust the fact that we share the load and look to the uh, diameter of the pelvic canal. We didn't lost we didn't lost any kind of diameter of pelvic canal <clears throat> so this is a good good healing process and this is the cat after a couple of months still not perfect but doing better at home okay dealing with this kind of lameness but still in good health and this is the six month follow up at six months we are very happy because the cat is completely clinically normal so this is uh, from the clinical point of view a very very good result because <clears throat> the cat was walking and running etc in a full way okay clinically indistinguishable from a normal patient okay and very simple fixator two minutes more advertisement i will be back in two minutes thank you
Back again for the last part of the lecture. Okay, uh, this is a, a case that I'm quite fond of because, okay, this is the case that can be quite complex and in fact, eventually, of course, I'm telling this afterwards, not before, but eventually it was quite simple. Of course, we need also <clears throat> a, a, a little bit of, uh, of uh, lucky situation, but okay, we can manage, okay? So we have this kind of situation, situation. Um, luxation of a hip and uh, fracture luxation of the left one. So this dog cannot wait bare in the short period. I don't like, even though it's a small dog, I don't like the philosophy to perform femoral, hand and neck or stachnomy in small dogs. Unless, of course, we have a fracture of the head. Because if you have a fracture of the head, difficult situation, uh, I would, okay, consider it. But as a first option, I don't consider the option of neck, head and neck ostectomy if the hip is reducible, okay? And in good condition yet. And on the opposite side, we need to stabilize the fractal luxation in order to allow the dog to wait there, okay? How can I perform this reduction of the luxated hip? I cannot perform an Emmer's link. Why? Because of course, if I perform an Emmer's link, the dog won't be allowed to wait there on it. I want him to wait there on it. So <clears throat> I use this technique that I like, I like a lot, examine the femoral head, okay? It shouldn't be fractured, it should be fine. Then identify the borders of the ruptured capsule, joint capsule. If you identify it, don't push, don't just push the femoral head inside the acetabulum. Put a couple of stitches on the border of the joint capsule and pull on them in order to be able to reduce the femoral head having the joint capsule around the femoral head and put a couple of stitches on it in order to stabilize the joint capsule on the femoral neck, okay? This is mandatory. And then, a very simple technique to stabilize the fracture, the luxation, sorry, of uh, the hip. That is suturing of the tendon of the gluteus medius to the tendon on the rectus femoris. The gluteus medius tendus, tendon is straightforward. We see it. We are close to it, so no problem at all with that. How can I identify the uh, uh, tendon of the rectus femoris? If you palpate, sorry. If you palpate here, this area of the acetabulum, you can palpate this rough area that is cranial on the acetabulum, okay? This rough area is where the tendon of the rectus femoris insert. And you can palpate as a big rope, okay? As a matter of fact, if you are not sure, when you insert this stitch here on the tendon, you can actually elevate the dog with the, with the suture. If the suture will cut through soft tissue, you wear not through the tendon of the, rect, of the uh, rectus femoris muscle, okay? This is very strong tendon. 
and then you you tighten the the stitch like this very simple very straightforward if you want you can put a couple of them as well but very straightforward small incision 15 minutes 20 minutes procedure okay then we change the position and we put the position as we want this is the surgical wound for reduction of the luxation of the hip and then we will start with reduction of the luxation the sacroiliac luxation usually it is always cranial and dorsal the ideal wing so with this tippet forcep we can perform the reduction and once we have the re the reduction achieve the reduction <clears throat> i like to stabilize with a screw compression screw that means i perform a bigger hole here on the ilial wing and a threaded hole here on the sacral process i perform the hole and the thread on the sacral person viewing it, simply moving the ilial wing so that I can, I am able to see the white area where I should perform this threaded hole. Why I use a bigger hole, that is the sliding hole, but even bigger of the sliding hole, <clears throat> and this is the reason why I use this washer underneath the head of the screw for two reasons. First of all, I need a sliding hole to achieve compression. This is standard technique, but there is one more important thing. I'm not able to follow the same axis between the two holes. If the axis of the two holes mismatch, I won't be able to insert the screw if it's uh, fixed in this axis. A bigger hole will allow the screw to adapt to the axis of the hole into the sacrum. Okay, so this the the uh, screw will slide in position spontaneously, and this will help me a lot in order to insert the skill. And then I will assert, insert an anti-rotational K wire, like this. Then, second either wing, tibial tuberosity, is ischial tuberosity on one side, ischial tuberosity on the other side. Straightforward, very simple, very predictable way to do that, okay? Like this. <clears throat> reducted surgical wound to reduce the ideal wing sacroiliac luxation, inserting the first feather pin and then standard frame on the pelvis. Standard. You don't have to invent anything here, okay? Or, or, or at least I'm happy if you invent something, but this is very predictable way. <clears throat> okay, look to this. A minimum of room between this bar and the tail root. Why? Because the dog should be able to elevate the tail during defecation. And this is the post-op lateral view. This dog will be allowed to full weight bear, of course, <clears throat> restricted, but full weight bear immediately after the surgery. Immediately after the surgery. And with this radiolucent fixator, we can check easily, easily check the stabilization that we perform, the osteosynthesis that we perform. Okay? So, very easy this is the dog <clears throat> some weeks two three weeks after the surgery is walking normally 
already. The management of the fixator is like the management of other external fixator, meaning the protection, the bandage is not to protect the fixator, is to prevent that the dog will get caught in furniture, in fences, etc. So it shouldn't get caught, okay? And after four or five weeks, we already add the stabilization and we can check for that if everything is correctly in place like this, <clears throat> we can remove the fixator. Look at this. This, this is a picture that in my experience is very common in dogs that have the hip luxated. Even though it didn't relaxate, but nevertheless, with frog positioning, the femoral head will displace a lot compared to the contralateral one. In my experience, this is not an issue, okay? Unless, of course, it will relaxate. But this is not an issue. It's simply due to the fact that we have a residual laxity of this joint. And this is follow-up after one year. Complete and full functional recovery. So with a quite simple technique, we could manage a potentially complex uh, situation without performing any femoral head and neck ostectomy that I don't like at all and I don't suggest at all. <clears throat> if you have further questions, we can write to me. This is my email address. So you can write and ask for anything, even though we have the question session in two minutes. Why two minutes? Because now we have two minutes advertisement. I will be back in two minutes. Okay, back here. Um, I will take any question, if any. So please feel free to put questions on the chat that you have on the right side of your screen. Um, the uh, webinar was uh, recorded. This means that if you or some friends of yours uh, are willing to see it again, to recheck for some details, or you missed a part of the webinar, uh, you can see it on our YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel. Okay, you can see the link on uh, our website. 
Okay. <clears throat> Christian Torres. Uh, have you used external fixation in bilateral sacral relaxation? If so, it works fine. Okay, in the case of the cat, if you remember, the cat crashed by the forklift. We have bilateral fracture luxation, sacroiliac fracture luxation, and we use the same technique. I think that this technique will help a lot because if the pelvis will stay stable, what, what is the uh the the reason the main reason why the pelvis will fracture in different points if it start breaking on one side the other side will be overloaded and it will fracture as well if you keep the pelvis very stable as a, a unit as a unit as a box it will be much stronger, much stronger. And this is the reason why I think it can be very useful for stabilization. Uh, Christian Torres, uh, uh, si quieres, we podemos hablar de, del tema en español también, si quieres, vale? Por lo cual, cuando quieras. If there are other questions, Okay, just 10. Okay, someone is typing again. So just waiting for the question to show up. The question is if I prefer triangle fixation or box fixation. I think both of them are valuable. Uh, the reason for triangle fixation sometimes is simply because the distance between the two cranial threaded pins is shorter than the distance of the two caudal pins on uh, issue tuberosities. So you are more or less invited. You are more or less uh, prone to make this triangular simply because when you put the, the bars, the connection bars, you are already like this. So instead of creating a new frame structure, you simply put a clamp, a single clamp on the cranial part of the fixator, and that's all. So uh, just for the shake of uh, easiness, easy, make it easy. So well, if it's effective, I prefer it's uh, easier provided that it has proven that it's effective, of course. One other question coming. I take the option, uh, waiting uh, just a few seconds to say bye bye to my friend Dalibor Adamat from Slovakia. Sometimes that we don't meet. Okay. <clears throat> Jose Mauro. Saludos desde Mexico. Mexico. Saludos por mi parte también. It what it was a little bit <laughs> peculiar of this webinar is that it, it was in English, but we had uh, most of the registered attendees from Spanish talking countries. 
So just peculiar, not, not bad, not bad, but peculiar. Okay, so no more questions. Uh, if you have the next day questions, as already told, uh, you can email me. Uh, and uh, next week, radius ulnar fractures in uh, toy breeds given by Dr. Jan Nisdo from Prague. Okay, you can also see the old program on your on our website as soon as we are able to put all the scheduled lectures. Okay, we, we don't fulfill the program so far, so it, it's incomplete so far, but we will fulfill the lectures, missing lecture as soon as the invited speaker will confirm that they are available okay good nice to meet you uh see you somewhere of course as always bye bye